let's take a look at a class conducted by Professor Sakai. This class is part of the first year seminars, FYS, for freshmen. With a small class size, one of the objectives of the seminar is to break down the psychological barriers that exist between students and teachers. I'm sure that for first year students, this kind of unique class will enhance their motivation to study and widen their understanding of various fields in the sciences. Well, another objective of the seminars is to change students' high school mindsets to more academic ones. Rather than just memorize content written in textbooks, the professor teaches students to look at many different aspects of scientific inquiry. I'm very excited to see what those classes are like. Let's first look at the art of scientific thinking, history of science and quest for facts and passion by Professor Sakai. Uh, we're going to take you a little bit outside this, you know, textbook sort of facts and figures and things. And we're going to show you um, more high level science. And uh, basically, um, these three uh, parts are going to look at the different aspects of science <clears throat> from a higher level. And today, I'm just going to talk about the history of science and looking at facts and how facts actually come, where do they come from, how scientists think. So we're going to look at some of the uh, well-known scientists, not all of them obviously, there are so many of them. We're just going to look at some of the well-known scientists that made uh, breakthroughs in science. Okay? And not what they actually discovered too much in detail, but more what state of mind they had when they discovered, they made those discoveries. How they felt, how they thought. So that's very important as a scientist to study how scientists think. Um, it's not just about the, the uh, facts and figures in your textbooks. Of course it took a lot of time and effort by all these scientists to make those facts, but um, we should also study how the, um, they came up with these ideas. Okay, so um, we're just going to start now. So these are some of the traits of a good scientist, in my opinion. Uh, you need to have passion. Okay? You didn't just choose science because you had to or you were told to, because you want to. Okay? So you have to be passionate about whatever you're doing. That's very important. Uh, observation, you have to be observant. You have to have good observation skills and develop those skills. You have to be curious about things, about nature, about how things work, um, as all scientists do. And you have to be able to think deeply about different aspects of what you observe. Okay? And hopefully you'll be inspired to create new science. Okay? So it's not just about learning old science, but creating new facts, new figures, so that uh, you can uh, advance the scientific field, okay? So let's have a look at some of these scientists. So there are going to be several parts in the lecture. So in the first uh, part, we're going to look at observing nature, how scientists observe nature. Okay, so the first scientist we're going to look at is Archimedes. Does anybody know who Archimedes is? <laughs> so, he's uh, from, let's say, 2000, around 2,300 years ago, so it's quite a long time ago. And at that time, uh, the king of, uh, he was actually a Greek scientist, and at that time, he was asked uh, by the king to discover whether the crown is, uh, is fake, made of pure gold, or is it made from silver. So, he, his task was to discover whether this crown which was created it was uh, is real or fake and so one day you know he was taking a bath <laughs> when he sinks he realizes you know the water is displaced so at that time he was just inspired suddenly by this fact and came up with this with buoyancy the, the concept of buoyancy and displacement of water so the volume of his own volume is being displaced by the water and that means that he can work out uh, the volume of irregular shapes by measuring the, the 
displacement of water. So at that time he, you know, he was inspired and he was so excited he just jumped out of his house naked, running through the uh, streets, you know, saying Eureka, which means I found it. Okay, uh, so then he could, you know, uh, discover the uh, the uh, volume of um, uh, the density of of the crown, and hence know that whether it's it's equivalent to gold or silver or, or so on. If it's pure gold, then he would uh, discover that. Um, so that's our first scientist. And here's a famous quote by him. He said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Now, he didn't discover the lever, but he really he explained how levers work. Now, levers, um, maybe some of you have, who has studied levers in high school? Do you know levers? Fulcrums, yeah. So he explained that, so that's one of his famous sayings. Okay, so for the, the first part was looking at nature and how observing nature and seeing how things may trigger some kind of inspiration. Now, we're going to look at how uh, scientists do experimentation. Okay, just some basic experimentation. We're going to look at some of the more recent. Has anyone heard of J.J. J. Thompson? No? Yes? Yes? Does anyone know what that is? Can I hear? Cathode ray tube? Yeah? <laughs> so, anyway, this is J.J. J. Thompson. Okay, I drew this just three days ago. So, <laughs> um, And what he did, he did an experiment with the cathode ray tube. And he discovered that the, the rays, the cathode rays, actually bend under um, electromagnetic field. Okay? And they bend towards the positive charge. So what he discovered from this is that they're actually electrons. Okay? So he was the uh, discoverer of electrons. And um, on top of that, he made a model of the atom. The uh, Thomson's plum pudding model of the atom heat. And what this, uh, this says is that the atom, which is basically what everything is made of, is like a pudding, like, like a jelly sort of thing, and, or, or say, let's say what a watermelon, and the electrons are actually the seeds implanted in there. And this, this sort of pudding is, is, has a positive charge the whole thing, and um, the electrons have negative charges. Okay, so this is this was the first model. Uh, now we will see what problem it had soon. Now uh, Thomson had a, had many students, seven of which won Nobel prizes, which means he was a very good teacher, um, including his son. His son also won a Nobel prize in, in physics, I think, I believe, including himself, of course. Um, now, one of the students of Thompson, does anyone know one of the famous students of Thompson, who it was? It starts with R. Who, who said something? I think I, I heard it correctly, but can you say it louder? Rutherford? Exactly. Yes. Ernest Rutherford was one of the students of Thompson. But before we look at that, well, let, let's have a look at one of the quotes by Thompson, it is the charm of physics that there are no hard and fast boundaries, that each discovery is not a terminus, but an avenue leading to country as yet unexplored. And that however long the science may exist, there will still be an abundance of unsolved problems. Okay, just looking at the, the um, unlimited potential of scientific discovery. Ernest Rutherford. Okay, Ernest Rutherford, uh, as I mentioned, was a student of J.J. Um, uh, Thompson, okay, and he did another kind of experiment, uh, commonly well known as the gold foil experiment, okay. So basically, there was an uh, alpha particle emitter, as you can see, and there, there was a thin, very thin piece of gold foil, and uh, a detecting screen around it. And so this alpha particle emitter would just emit alpha particles, shoot it at this uh, thin gold film. And then there is a detection of where these 
alpha particles hit the screen, the detecting screen. Okay. So uh, let's look at this in detail. So that's what it looks like. This is the experiment setup, right? And here's Rutherford. Okay. Now you need a dark room for that. <laughs> okay. So in a dark room, what does Rutherford do? Starts counting all these. Flashes on the go on the um, screen. Now most of them all are at the um, hit at the back, but some of them are deflected, right? Some of them are, get deflected. So what happens? Some of them are bouncing back. So he starts thinking about this. He says, okay, if the plum putting model really is the way the atom is, then sh it shouldn't do that. It should just go straight in, right? It should the alpha particles should go straight in. They shouldn't bounce back. Something's not right. Okay? So, started thinking about this and realized that this is not the, way, the, the case. This is not the way it looks like. The atom doesn't look like that, but instead it looks like this. So, there's a nucleus, positively charged, and then the electrons just go around it. Okay? So, this was... Uh, oops, sorry. Rutherford's planetary model of the atom. Part 5, imagine. Okay. <coughs> Who's this? <laughs> Everyone must know this, right? <laughs> it's the icon of science. <laughs> All right, so Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein made his discoveries sitting on a chair or sailing a boat. Uh, it's something really interesting about all these scientists is that when they made their biggest discoveries, they were not stressed out like in their books, you know, oh, like this. No, they were like really relaxed. They were dreaming. They were sailing. They were, uh, you know, just under an apple tree, just, you know. It, they were either in nature or just very relaxed. What does that tell you about the state of mind you have to be in when you study science? got to be relaxed. Passionate, alert, but relaxed. Okay? That's very important. You don't want to be stressed out about things, okay? Okay. So, um, so what did Einstein do? <laughs> Einstein did a lot of things, right? Uh, one of the uh, greatest, most well-known equations, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light, power of 2, right? What it basically says is the... Um, you know, matter and energy are inter interchangeable, right? He discovered this. Um, and he wasn't, he was just, you know, just thinking, and he imagined a lot. He didn't do a lot of experimentation, but he did every, a lot of things in his head. <coughs> and, um, and that's where uh, most of his work came, and also uh, work on gravity and things like that, and also relativity, okay? Um, The time on a, you know, a spaceship or something moving really fast is what? Slower or faster than time still? Hmm? Slower, right? Slower, right? The, uh, like static time, right? This is, uh, this is a fundamental aspect of uh, relativity that he discovered. Okay? Now, all of this he did it in his imagination. Thought experiments. He couldn't experiment this, could he? <laughs> I mean... It was just uh, uh, physically impossible to go at the speed of light, so he imagined it. He imagined it. And uh, it took many years before uh, his theories were confirmed. But it all happened in his mind, right? <clears throat> so, famous quote by Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. Right? Knowledge you get from your textbooks. Right? But how does that help in creating new science, new discoveries? You have to imagine, right? Or you have to experiment. In his case, imagination was his most powerful tool. Now, we are all different, right? You might you may like to experiment things. You may like to imagine it, you may like to experiment it, you may like to observe it. 
you may like to work through it, you got to find your style. So all these different scientists had different ways of just making their discoveries and breakthroughs. Okay, so it's very important that you find your style. Okay, and it doesn't have to be exactly what these people do. You might find a new way. But what's important is passion and uh, creativity. Now, these are some of the important things that you can do just to start you up, right? Um, so instead of, you know, memorizing facts and figures from your textbook, okay, try to find a problem or observe a phenomenon. Get inspired, get excited. Um, brainstorm, look at it from different points of views and perspectives. Um, imagine, interact, try new ways, okay? So imagine is in your mind, interact is using experiments, um, trying new ways. Don't forget what uh, Edison said, trying new ways, right? Um, ask silly questions. There are no wrong questions. There may be a lot of wrong answers, but there are no wrong questions. So don't be afraid to ask questions from your teachers, from other people, scientists, yourself. <laughs> you are the most powerful person to ask questions from. You can ask yourself a question and try to figure out an answer. Right? So asking questions is very important in science. Um, and so is experimenting and testing. If you can experiment and test something, do it. Right? Okay. And be creative. All right? So question what you cannot understand. Be passionate about what you do. And a great formula is a sense of passion, curiosity, and determination in, if you want to be successful in science. Okay? Um, one thing I want from you guys is to be more interactive. Uh, I want you to ask questions. As I said, question is very important in science. Okay? I want you to ask questions. I want you to interact with each other, discuss with each other. Not just here, but outside. Whatever you see. Okay, make observation, talk to your friends, discuss, okay? Write down things, notes. You see something interesting, right? You can't explain it, write it down, try to find it out. Uh, so what, what is important is that you start thinking like a scientist from now. Okay, you just started uh, coming to university. And if you can develop the skills of a good scientist now, it becomes second nature to you. You don't have to try it. It, it just happens. You naturally start thinking like a good scientist. And a good scientist usually becomes not just a good scientist, but a good citizen of a society because they won't just accept whatever they hear and, you know, they think about things, they study things, and, and they make good contributions, right? That's very important. Okay, so I want you to... Uh, be more proactive. Be, be more pro proactive, okay? Um, don't be passive in your learning, okay? Don't just uh, go to lectures and memorize facts and do problems in your lectures. Um, live outside the classroom, okay? You come to the classroom to learn some facts and figures, but I want you to extend that skill of a good scientist, like these scientists that we presented right today, I want you to be like them, you know, go outside and try to observe, okay, interact, and hopefully come up with something amazing, okay. I was really inspired by many things he said, but let me first mention that the animation on the PowerPoint slides was amazing, and I don't think there could be anyone who is not hooked by his animations. Was this produced by a publishing company? You might be surprised to hear it, but Professor Sakai created it all by himself. Really? So he is not only a great science teacher, but quite skilled with PowerPoint as well. The professor believes the use of animation is an important technique for interacting with students since it grabs their attention. I totally agree with that. Apart from the animation, the intonation of his voice was clear, cheerful, and I like how he laughs a lot. If the professor is looking happy, 
I would also feel comfortable and be more relaxed in class. As you could see at the end of the video clip, Professor Sakai was talking to the new freshmen. There he said that he wants them to think about science and really encouraged them to ask questions during the class. I could see that he is very enthusiastic and sincerely tries to develop an effective teaching style for science courses that helps students to learn how to think like a scientist. He seems to be seeking the most effective methods for helping students acquire scientific ways of thinking.